Tonight, will you dedicate your body to iPhone science? South by Southwest becomes a no drone zone, and we remember Sir Terry Pratchett. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 293 for March 12, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you can monitor your income, spending, and the performance of your investments on a single, easy-to-read screen. And have I mentioned that it's free? To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash TN2. Welcome back to Tech News Tonight. I'm Megan Maroney. Let's get right to the news. All week we've been covering Monday's Apple event, and tonight we'll talk to one man who wore the Apple Watch on his very wrist and lived to tell about it. Rafe Needleman, Editorial Director of Yahoo Tech. Welcome. Good to be back. How are you? I am good. So what are your thoughts four days later? Has the shine worn off? <clears throat> it's not irritating my wrist. Um, I did not expect to like the Apple Watch uh, quite as much as I did. Um, but it is really, really, really beautiful. And the watch faces are stunning. Uh, am I going to buy one? No. But it's a really nice piece of jewelry uh, for an electronic gizmo. It's, I mean, I, I wasn't even wearing the $17,000 rose gold one. I had the uh, mid-range one. I think it was, I don't know, around $500. It was a, a black chrome metal uh, with a black band on and I really wanted to take it home with me. It's it's beautiful. Now, you ordered a Pebble watch right before the Apple Watch announcement. Yeah. I, I did had, a story on that. Yeah, I ordered one also, and now yeah. I, I, don't, I'm, I think we're both having a little bit of buyer's remorse. Uh, you're not? Well, I'm not because practically, if I don't like the Pebble, which I got at the pre-order price, I can sell it, <laughs> you know, and then go take that money and go buy it, an Apple Watch. But what the Pebble has that... I like is uh, a seven-day battery, or realistically, maybe a five-day battery, right? Um, and an always-on display. And those kind of those things matter to me. I mean, the Apple is very sensitive. As soon as you lift it up, the watch face comes on, or you tap it, or the watch comes on. But when you're not looking at it, it's a blank slab, just a big piece of blank of black glass, and it kind of looks a little, you know, badass. But still, it, it's just it should be on all the time. It's a watch, after all. And the Pebble is always on. Now, the Pebble's not, displays aren't nearly as beautiful as the Apple's, but they're always there. Uh, and then the battery life thing. I mean, I don't mind winding a watch every day because it's always right there. But if you forget to charge up the watch, and when I go home, I take my watch off immediately. And I have to remember to take it off and put it in a charger, which I'm not going to do. I mean, my phone stays with me, but the watch goes somewhere else. So I don't really like the idea of having to charge a phone every day. And with the Apple Watch, you will have to charge it every single day. Right. So now, that's just me. Yeah. Are you worried that uh, that Pebble that Apple will start to ignore the Pebble and not make it as compatible with the iPhone as they could because they're pushing the Apple Watch? I don't think the Pebble is a serious threat to the Apple Watch. Considering Apple's marketing muscle and their developer relations muscle, I think the Pebble is going to be a drop in the bucket and Apple doesn't really have to worry about it. I don't think the Pebble is going to steal any sales from the Apple Watch. Um, and Apple, the Pebble Watch works through standard defined Bluetooth specs. So I don't know what Apple could do or would do to make it less compatible. That would just be mean and they don't need to. I mean, they're going to sell enough watches anyway. That's true. Well, there was an article I saw today. They've done some research that millennials are not necessarily, if you're over 35, you're interested in the Apple Watch. Under 35, not so much. Not yet. Really? Yeah. Oh, because under 35-year-olds don't wear wristwatches. Right. They're, they're in the valley in that, that XKCD uh, uh, cartoon of this period where our, our wrists were busy with watches. And then there was this period now, which we're just ending, where mm -hmm. we didn't have anything in our wrist. And then the period we're moving into, which is where all watches are smart. Uh, which I do believe, by the way, I do believe that in, in, the, in the fairly near future, all watches will be smart watches. They won't all be Apple watches, but Patek Philippe and Swatch and those guys will figure out how to add some connectivity to their watch, uh, to their watches so that basically they'll be doing a lot more than telling time no matter who makes them. Right. Well, I, I think one of the things Apple was saying, you know, you have the watch, then you won't check your phone as right. often. But now some people are saying like, you know, you would actually check it more often. Now you're going to be checking your watch 
all the time. So it'll be interesting whether what we do. Yeah, well, the watch will be alerting you. It'll give you a little tap, and you'll be looking at it, and, and that'll be the new, you know, screw you. Your my watch is more important than you are versus the phone or versus the way the watch used to be. Right. Ultimately, of course, the period we're in right now, where the watch is an accessory to the phone, will be a historical footnote. As everything gets miniaturized, the watch will be a phone, and you just decide whether you want to take a big screen with you or a little screen with you, and you'll be able to switch back and forth, and you won't need both. I mean, you can have both if you want, but. I don't think it makes sense that five years, so certainly not 10 years from now, that you will need both devices. You'll we'll have one. Everything will be implanted in directly into our brain at that or point, that. I think. Yes. Or that. Yeah, or beamed into your brain through lasers. Right. So you also got to hold the new MacBook, uh, mm -hmm. did, and you got to feel the keyboard. Did, did, the, did the keys feel different to you? Did you try them out? Some people said they didn't like the way the keys felt. Um, they, it definitely feels more solid. Um, I did have a chance to type on it, but no more than a few sentences. And it felt pretty good to me. I mean, I, I wasn't sitting down at my desk, you know, doing the usual typing thing. So I, I can't say that it was better or worse. I, I would say it was a little bit different. It felt more sturdy than the current uh, MacBook Air keyboard that I now have. Um, and obviously, when you start to shrink computers down to this size, the, the key travel gets lower and lower. I mean, the days of the old ThinkPad keys or, you know, the, the clicky keys on the IBM Model M keyboards, those are long gone. So now we've got these little short travel keyboards. They've got to make them feel really good. I think the MacBook's pretty good. I, I think it'll be fine for typing. It's kind of the ultimate journalist's or writer's, traveling writer's computer because it's so small and thin and has such great battery life and such a horrible CPU in it. That is just, it's really good for writing. Right, writers that can afford a $1,300 computer. Right. <laughs> Not the struggling ones. Uh, so no. So were you able to play with the Force Touch, the new trackpad that adjusts yes. to how hard you touch it? Uh, yeah, it was really cool. So it's, um, I wasn't sure how much of what I was feeling when I, I was using this trackpad, which has a couple of key differences. I wasn't sure how much of it was, was actual physical uh, response and was computer generated, which is interesting. So this new trackpad, first of all, instead of being hinged at the top like the current one, like a diving board, as I said in the presentation, it's basically one big button with sensors all around it. And it has a little pushback motor, an actuator, that works under software control. So when you press down on this thing, it pushes, it gives you a click back. And if you press harder, it'll give you a second click if the software supports it. So, for example, you can be watching a video and the, the, the force touch or whatever it's called and when you really wail on the, on the trackpad and hold it down, it'll go faster. And if you press harder, it'll go faster still. Uh, or the other demo was, which I tried, um, where you, uh, you click on a file and then you press down really hard on the file and you get preview. That was just really neat. I like that. I think that'll become second nature to people. Yeah. Uh, so let's move on to research kit. That was the, some people say the biggest announcement uh, at the Apple event. Uh, what are your thoughts? So Research Kit is this um, initiative that Apple has in, put into uh, the iPhone where they're letting researchers borrow the sensors in the phone to collect medical or health data for research purposes. And I think it's fascinating. There are issues with it, but it's really, really interesting. So, for example, if you want, if you're a doctor and you want to know how your Parkinson's patient is doing, you can run the research kit Parkinson's app on the phone and measure over a long period of time the tremors in their body, their gait, their speed, their exercise, and even give them tests. They, they showed a test where you have to tap something on the phone multiple times, and that's like the computer game, but it's a test and you can just put it on your phone. So the cost for research hardware goes down, and that, that's one thing. So that's a doctor interacting with a patient, which is very valuable, but what they're really pushing for research kit was the ability to collect a lot of data from a lot of people, which is where the problems show up. So if I want to do a study across everybody who has Parkinson's, I can ask, I can put a study out, a survey out and say, download this app and collect this data for us, and then we'll collect it, you know, and do statistics on it. And that's really interesting. So the problem is that that might not be a very well-selected group of people. It might be self-selected to people who can afford iPhones, for example. So that's one of the issues is the survey sample that you get, the panel sample that you get, might not be as rigorous, even if it is way more uh, inexpensive to collect 
than what you would get from a, a current scientific study. Right. So it's not only the people that have iPhones, but it's the people that are tech savvy enough to know how to install whatever app it is. Right. Or, yeah. So the, I read that they had over 11,000 people sign up in 24 hours. Now, do you sign up generally for research kit or do you sign up for through for a certain research study? Do you know how that works? Uh, no, I haven't tried it yet, having neither asthma nor arthritis nor Parkinson's or any of the things that they're um, measuring, at least not that I know of. Um, <laughs> That's good. I hope not. Um, I knocked wood for you. Thank you. Um, so I, I don't know. But I, I think the whole idea is, is that research kit is a framework for collecting this information and then protecting it. So Apple was very clear that they don't store this information. They don't keep it. They don't collect any PII, PII personally identifiable information that goes with it. They just make it possible for this research to happen. So I hope they're right about that because yes, this is sensitive data. <laughs> exactly. So you are headed to South by Southwest next week with your team. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you yeah. guys going to be doing over there. Well, we've we'll been doing a couple of cool interviews, but the big thing that we're doing is we're having the ultimate fanboy challenge, I, and I love this. So David Pogue are, is going to be the MC for this game show where we've got these two guys. We've got a, uh, a fanboy, an Android fanboy, and we've got an Apple iPhone fanboy, and we're putting them up on stage, and we're giving them challenges. Well, I'm not going to tell you what they are because I don't want them to see this and know what the challenges are. But they've got to complete these challenges uh, quickly, accurately, and with flair. And then we'll be awarding a, a silly prize to the winner at the end. Because we want to know once or for all who has the better fanboys, Apple or Android. And we intend to find out. Well, David Pogue is moderating this. Now, he's not necessarily yes. unbiased, is he? Uh, he is a professional reviewer. Um, he is well, I mean, I, 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 people accuse people of all sorts of things, but right. I've been over the script and it's as fair. We argued about the script and the tasks for a long time to make sure that both sides get a fighting chance. Um, and as we said, this thing is uh, half science project, half review, half serious. It's going to be a lot of fun. And mostly it's just to see. Uh, to get these fanboys riled up and 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 t take uh, pot shots at the other one. Well, but I, I we, like. We it. don't have, we don't have a dog in the hunt. We just want it to be a lot of fun, and we think it will be. It looks like a lot of fun. I, I saw yeah. videos of both of the fanboys uh, online, and you can see uh, yep. how dedicated they are. Yeah, so. Derek and John. Yeah, they're awesome guys. We found we we went on a search and we found some great guys. Great. So finally, I know you're a geek dad. Today, the yeah. BBC announced that they'd be giving away a mini computer to every 11-year-old child in Great Britain. The mini computers are called micro bits. They're like the Raspberry Pi, the little computer that helps kids learn how to co code. What do you think of this? I think the more people that know how to code, the better. Um, I'm not familiar with this particular computer. I mean, my eight-year-old has uh, has worked on a Pi, uh, uh, a Raspberry Pi, uh, the the Kano kit, which uses a Pi. Uh, he programs in Scratch. Uh, he's trying to learn Python. Uh, basically, he can't stay focused on any one language long enough to learn it. But he's trying. And anything that gets kids interested in coding is awesome. I mean, it's not just enough to give them the hardware. You've also got to give them the education. The teachers have to learn this. I mean, the hard part is not getting computers in the hands of kids and getting kids interested in programming. I mean, you give a kid something like this, and it's an extension of their brain, and it makes them feel powerful and uh, smart, and it's awesome. The real problem is helping you know, primary school educators understand how to teach this stuff. And I hope there's a program behind that uh, so that we can, they can really nurture the development of, of these young minds to help them to think for the 21st century. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Rafe Needleman, your editorial director at Yahoo Tech. And have a great time in Austin next week. Yeah. And See you there. Uh, no, I will be here. Someone's got to uh, hold down this chair. So, all right. <laughs> all right. All right. If you're going to be at if you're going to be at South by, come by uh, Brazos Hall Monday high noon for the Fanboy Challenge. Excellent. We will be looking forward to it. <laughs> Thanks, Rafe. Thank you. And coming up, who wants to read the 400 pages of net neutrality rules and explain them to me? And Google Code is dead. But first, keep track of your investments on multiple websites. That's a hassle. You don't want to do that. With Personal Capital, you have everything all in one place on your desktop, your smartphone, or your tablet. With Personal Capital's financial software, you get one-click 
analyzers so you can discover your net worth, aggregate all your accounts into one interface, and drill down to the details. You can analyze your cash flow down to every penny. Take the headache out of household budgeting and make sure your bills are in track with your budget. Forecast the value of your retirement portfolio. See if you're saving and investing enough to last for your ideal retirement plan. You can also detect 401k and mutual fund fees and find out if fees are delaying your retirement. It's your money, so make more of it. Signing up only takes a minute and you'll see the benefits immediately. Personal Capital gives you total clarity and transparency to make better investment decisions right away. To set up your free account, go to personalcapital.com slash TN2. Personal Capital is free and it's the smart way to grow your money. We thank Personal Capital for their support of Tech News Tonight. And now for the rest of the news. It's been two weeks since the vote on net neutrality, and today the FCC finally explained exactly what the rules are and exactly what they mean. If you'd like to know, feel free to read the 400-page PDF that they posted online or just read the news about it, as I did. According to the New York Times, the rules were pretty much as expected. High-speed Internet access will now be reclassified as, tel as a telecommunications service rather than an information service, and providers will be expected to abide by stricter regulations under Title II of the Communications Act of 1934. Some folks have done some deep dives into the rules. Ars Technica is reporting that there are still loopholes in the plan, especially when it comes to AT&T's throttling of unlimited data. And Mashable reports that posting videos that came from your drone could be illegal. Rex Santos writes that YouTuber Jason Haynes received a cease and desist letter claiming that the videos taken from his DJI Phantom could not be used commercially. Although Haynes does have monet monetization enabled on his YouTube account, he has not accepted any payments from Google. And in other quadcopter news, don't bring your drones to this year's South by Southwest conference. Late yesterday, organizers of the Austin Festival instituted a strict no drones policy due to safety issues. I am still waiting to see if South by Southwest organizers will also ban Meerkat. It's getting a little out of control, people. Google Code is shutting down. According to the Google Open Source blog, the Google Code Project hosting service that's been around since 2006 will disable new project creation starting today. Google will completely shut down the service in January 2016. Google cites spam and abuse as part of the problem with Google Code, and the company admits that even they have moved projects to places like GitHub. And finally, beloved science fiction writer Terry Pratchett died this morning after a long battle with a rare form of early onset Alzheimer's disease. He was 66 years old. Pratchett wrote more than 70 books, but is perhaps most famous for his Discworld series. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. And watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.